and we'll start yes uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen uh, colleagues from india uh, this is one more episode of uh, igm pure talks we, by now everybody knows every tuesday 8 pm we have uh, one expert either from india or anywhere in the world talking to you about a certain topic today we have dr aman chavan who's from the university of kentucky uh, he is um, i think from manipal the kasturba medical college manipal and has been working uh, on neuroendocrine tumors for a long time he's got his own work original articles on neuroendocrine tumors he is going to talk to you about uh, the recent advances in the management of neuroendocrine tube screen and your presentation on uh, from your device and uh, the way we go is uh, uh, we will have dr chavan talking to you complete his talk uh, as usual you can uh, put your questions in the chat box and once the talk is over then we'll take the questions one by one uh, we also have uh, aju matthew was a dear friend who um, has been instrumental uh, in inviting dr aman chavan to give a talk to us uh, so we welcome uh, him and welcome everybody and over to you dr chavan thank you so much dr kulkarni i really appreciate everybody here especially dr kulkarni and dr matthew for uh, this honor to be able to talk to uh, wonderful fellows and hemong fellows in india um my name is aman chohan one of the assistant professor of medicine uh, at marky cancer center university of kentucky and neuroendocrine tumors and neuroendocrine neoplasms uh, to be more precise are my area of clinical and research expertise and, and honestly my passion um and uh, recently i've been bestowed with uh, with uh, honor of directing our prrt program uh, for neuroendocrine tumors at marky cancer center so today i would like to uh, basically um, give a broad overview about neuroendocrine cancers and specifically talk about recent advances especially the advances which have changed practice rather than more uh, academic uh, or drugs in development i talk more about uh, the 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 standard of care changing trials and practices and uh, for this particular talk neuroendocrine cancer is a big field and uh, in these are these are uh, heterogeneous cancers group of different type of cancers but for today's talk we'd like to focus more on gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumor and lung neuroendocrine cancers both low grade and high grade neuroendocrine carcinomas i will not be talking about um cancers like small cell carcinomas be it lung small or extra thoracic small cell carcinoma uh, paraganglioma merkel cell pheochromocytomas these are also a uh, type of neuroendocrine cancer some are low grade like pheos and paras and some are high grade like small cells and merkel cell but we won't be talking about those cancers in today's talk um in general the talk would be divided between uh, advances or recent updates in epidemiology pathological classification tumor genetics diagnostics and treatment this is one area uh, of oncology where we've really seen um changes in almost all of these fronts you know and and as i walk you through you'd be very uh, pleasantly surprised with all the advancements and strides we have made in last 5 to 10 years so just a brief primer what neuroendocrine tumors are neuroendocrine tumors are a group of rare tumors which can arise from anywhere in the body okay they they uh, arise from these specialized cells called neuroendocrine cells for example enterochromaffin cells in the gut right the incidence is pretty low but prevalence is very high because most of these neuroendocrine cancers uh, are indolent and that means they they um, fortunately a lot of our patients live for a long time so the cumulative pre prevalence is very disproportionate to incidence 
treatment options are limited as compared to uh, your uh, breast cancer or the colon cancers or some other GI malignancies. However, we have seen the needle moving in that area. And as, as we talk further, you will uh, you'll be happy to, to see there have been few new FDA approvals in, in our field. Okay, so let's talk uh, real quick about uh, updates in epidemiology, right? Everybody's fun favorite topic. No, I'm just kidding. All righty, this is a landmark paper from JAMA Oncology. Our colleagues from MD Anderson, Dr. Dasari, he recently published uh, the, the updated SEER database of view. You know, SEER is one of uh, cancer epidemiology uh, database, uh, and it's a pretty high quality cancer statistics database. And as you can see, the top line in blue, it represents the cancer incidence of all major malignancies, be colon, lung, GI cancers, uh, for past 40 years, so four or five decades. And, and initially, when you, uh, you know, about three decades, and there was slight increase in the incidence, um, you know, then we started seeing some decline in the incident, probably because of uh, lesser people smoking and colonoscopies. Um, but overall, the incidence for major malignancies has remained plateaued, which is good. Uh, we would like to see these decline, but it has kind of remained plateaued. On the contrary, if you see the bottom line in the yellow, that's the neuronicin tumor incidence. It used to be one per 100,000 or a million cases back in 1973s. And, and fast forward to the most recent data we have uh, in this publication, 2012, where we are talking about five and a half cases per 100,000. It is expected that the current incidence is probably uh, six to seven per 100,000. So there is a, a linear incline in the incidence. This is quite stark to all other cancers. Well, a lot of people ask me, why is it so? Uh, and clearly there is uh, this um, improved diagnostics. We are scanning more people. We are doing more colonoscopies and we are finding most of these early stage cancers. However, is that all? Um, and that's a question uh, which needs to be researched. And if we continue to see this pattern that the, the incline in neuroendocrine incidence continues for next decade, I think we would be compelled to look into environmental factors because uh, our, our diagnostics are not improving at that rate at the, you know, to, to really justify continued increase of neuronicin tumor incidence. You know, this got me curious about checking our own database in Kentucky Cancer Registry, which is also a subsite of a SEER database, one of the nodal registries in the SEER database. And, uh, Unfortunately, our neuronicin tumor incidence is even higher than the national averages. You know, at the time of when we compiled the data, our incidence was about 10 uh, per, uh, per 100,000. And uh, as Dr. Matthews here, and he's worked with the uh, Markey Cancer Center in the past, he can attest to it. We served an underserved population, rural Appalachian population. So these patients, unfortunately, have limited uh, access to healthcare kind of can, uh, uh, similar to a lot of patients in India. So, so you know, not only we're seeing increased burden on these patients in, in Kentucky and rural Appalachia, but uh, sometimes they, the limited access to care or, or enough adequate doctors can also uh, compound these issues. So recently I wrote an op-ed on, uh, in JAMA Oncology, um, with the intent to raise awareness about neuronicin cancers. A uh, lot of uh, people don't know about it, or if they know about it, they know vaguely about it, and they always brush it under as uh, one of those rare cancers that they don't have to deal with it. I wanted to break that perception, and, and, and what basically what we published here, I looked into the SEER database uh, and, and kind of um, reported the cumulative prevalence and you'd be surprised to know neuroendocrine cancer is actually second most prevalent GI cancer, right after colorectal, right? So after colorectal is neuroendocrine, more than pancreatic, more than hepatobiliary, more than esophageal, right? Now, agreed, uh, 
there would be a subset of these patients which were caught early stage and probably underwent curative resection and they're okay, but there is a big chunk of population with metastatic disease. So, so we need to know about this condition unless we know we would not be able to device more treatments and monitor them and, and provide better care to these patients. Um, so that, that was uh, neuroendocrine tumor statistics for GI. What about lung? You know, if I have to divide neuroendocrine tumors based on the prevalence on the site, uh, the gastroenteropancreatic, uh, definitely the, the most prevalent, but after that, it's the lung neuroendocrine tumors is the second most prevalent site for, for neuroendocrine cancer in the body. And uh, if I have to divide all the lung neoplasms, these neuroendocrine cancers actually together, uh, you know, almost form one fourth of the pie, maybe a little less, 20% of the pie. You know, small cell lung cancer is a type of high grade neuroendocrine cancer. But today we will be focusing on low-grade neuroendocrine tumor carcinoid, which forms about 2%, and, and large cell neuroendocrine cancer, which is a high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma, a sister cancer uh, in a sort of small cell lung cancer, forms about 3% of uh, thoracic uh, neoplasms. A um, couple of years back, we also looked at our Kentucky Cancer Registry database and specifically uh, focusing on large cell neuroendocrine cancer. And what we found that over a period of last 10 years, the incidence had almost doubled uh, as a percentage of all neoplasm. So, so clearly either we are recognizing this rare condition more or there's truly uh, an increase in incidence of these neuroendocrine cancers for uh, reasons that we don't understand yet. However, the bottom line is increasing incidence of these rare neuroendocrine neoplasm mandates spreading awareness among gender population, educating our colleagues and community and fostering medical research. So that's why I always start with epidemiology because unless we understand the burden of disease, we would not be able to uh, take the field forward. Okay, moving forward, let's talk a little bit about uh, classification and pathology. Um, we have seen a tremendous amount of uh, development in this area as well. Uh, this is a relatively newer field of cancer as compared to lung cancer or colon cancer. And, and these WHO classifications were kind of formulated relatively recently. So um, if I have to broadly classify neuroendocrine neoplasms, uh, so neuroendocrine cancers are a spectrum of disease. It's not one disease, right? So you can classify neuroendocrine neoplasms into uh, low-grade spectrum with be more well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. And on the more aggressive spectrum would be high-grade neuroendocrine cancers like poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. So how do we differentiate? We are moving away from those old terminologies of carcinoid tumor, because they were very confusing, okay? So I want everybody to, to learn that we need to uh, make it very standard to use the newer nomenclature using neuroendocrine neoplasms. And there are two different types, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor or poor differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. The key word which makes them very different is tumor versus carcinoma, okay? And neuroendocrine tumor can be of three subtypes based on the grade of neuroendocrine tumors, grade one, grade two, and grade three. Neuroendocrine carcinoma, on other hand, they're always grade three. There are no low-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas, okay? So by definition, neuroendocrine carcinoma, very aggressive cancers. And, and the examples of these neuroendocrine carcinomas would be small cell carcinoma, large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, or poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma, uh, you can't really uh, elaborate further whether they are small cell or large cell histology because they're so uh, anaplastic and you know necrotic. So, and there is another entity called minin, which is mixed neuroendocrine, non-neuroendocrine nucleation. Okay, so uh, the the some of your folks who are savvy about neuroendocrine tumors, you've probably been following this nomenclature. This was introduced in 2010 by WHO, and then uh, this mixed neoplasm mining used to be known as MANIC, 
you know, which was mixed adenoneural endocrine neoplasm. But later on, we realized that it's not necessarily just adenocarcinoma is mixed with neuronicotinoids. It could be other histotype as well. And, and recently, WHO revised that terminology from manic to minin. It could be mixed neuronicotinoid, non neuronicotinoid neoplasm, as long as you have 30% or more of the other histotype uh, present in the tumor. Okay, let's delve a little bit more detail into it because pathology is the key. If we don't have a good grasp on pathology for neuronicotinoid cancer, we will get the diagnosis wrong and we will put the patient in the wrong um, treatment altogether. So this is a classic well-differentiated low-grade neuronicotinoid tumor. Right? You can see around, uh, you know, uh, very homogeneous looking cells and they stain for chromogranin, cyanophysin, and the middle slide shows you uh, staining for KI67. This is how we grade these neuronicotinoid tumors, right? So the, the KI67 uh, is very sparsely taken. So that means these cells are not rapidly dividing. So KI67 is low, okay? And usually we see if KI67 less than 3%, it's grade one. It's between three to 20% is grade two, okay? On the contrary, look at this high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma slide, right? And on one side, you see a very poorly differentiated, maybe large cell morphology. On this side, you are seeing more small round blue cells, you know, like oats. So this is small cell carcinoma, right? And in the middle, we are again looking at the KI67 staining, and you can see there's just intense amount of uptake in KI67. That tells you that these cells are proliferating really fast. So they're taking up all the KI67, right? So this is very high KI67, right? Uh, in my experience, it's by definition, high-grade neuronicotinoid carcinoma, they'll all have uh, KI67 more than 20%. But in reality, this small cell lung cancer or large cell neuronicotinoid carcinoma, they usually, you see the KI67 over 50, over 60, over 70 in that range, okay? So in 2010, this is what WHO did. They, they wanted to streamline how we diagnose neuronicotinoid tumors so that we can, you know, institute a better plan for not only treatment but surveillance. So they classified neuronicotinoid tumor into two, two uh, three groups: grade one, based on mitotic index, if less than two mitoses per 10 high far field, or less than three person KI67. Uh, grade two, if it's two to 20 uh, mitoses for 10 high far field or three to 20 person KI67, okay? And if it's more than 20 for both, uh, that is, was classified grade three. And all grade three used to be thought as poorly differentiated. So basically we only had grade one and grow well differentiated and all grade threes are poorly differentiated. Then what happened? Um, more as more people studied neuronicotinoid cancers and we realized not all grade threes are same, okay? Within the grade threes, there are some good actors and there are some really bad actors, okay? That, uh, by that, I mean aggressive biology and behavior of the cancers, right? So this is a very, uh, uh, you know, good study done by Dr. Tang, who's a very uh, eminent pathologist from Memorial Sloan Kettering. And, and she looked into the different grades of neuronicotinoid cancer, especially pancreatic. And as you can see, these both green, uh, the blue and the red lines, they represent high-grade neuronicotinoid cancers, but the red ones are, in particular, you see the outcome is pretty bad, okay? So when they looked into these and correlated the pathology, they realized that it's the morphology which is really critical for these high-grade neuronicotin cancers, right? So if you have well-differentiated morphology, they might do worse than your low-grade neuronicotin tumors, but they are still far better in terms of oral prognosis as compared to neuronicotin carcinoma. Okay, so morphology is really critical here. So if you are dealing with a large cell neuronicotinoid cancer or small cell cancer, those patients unfortunately have a really poor outcome and we really haven't made a big dent in the way we treat them over the past three decades. But the high grade, well differentiated histology tend to do somewhat better. Okay, and this again is an area 
uh, of growing interest and people are trying to research is what should we be treating these patients with? Uh, should we treat them with platinum-based chemotherapy like high-grade neuronegin carcinoma or should we treat them more like low-grade with somatostatin analogs, et cetera? So we'll get into that in a bit. So based on these growing evidence of data, <clears throat> WHO revised the classification in 2017. And now, unlike the previous classification where all grade threes were poorly differentiated carcinoma, now you had some grade threes which can be well differentiated. And so there's a complete new category added in 2017 WHO classification. So now well differentiated neuronicin tumors can be grade one, two, three based on KI67 index or mitotic index, okay? And the poorly differentiated neuronicin carcinoma, they're always grade three because we know they're always over 20%, okay? So morphology is key. Anytime you see a neuronicin cancer patient, look at the pathology, see what the morphology is. Is the pathologist alluding to neuronicin tumor or neuronicin carcinoma? That's your first, uh, point of division, which will help you decide, am I going to get a gallium scan or a FTG PET scan, right? So just giving you an example. Alrighty, moving forward, this picture is uh, kind of summarizes how knowing the pathology really helps us fine tune our management for these cancers. Okay, so just like I was mentioning, a low grade well differentiated neuronicin tumor, you would notice that these patients would have somatostatin receptors. So you would like to get a somatostatin receptor synthetic or imaging like gallium dotatate scan or octreo scan, okay? And you would treat them with low-grade neuronicin tumor regimens like somatostatin analog or mTOR inhibitor like Afinitor or Sutin. As compared to the higher grade uh, segment with poorly differentiated neuronicin carcinoma, they rarely have somatostatin receptors. Some of them can, but they rarely. So you would rather order an FDG PET because you're looking for very hypermetabolic lesions, right? And you would treat them with the cytotoxic chemotherapy, the most well-studied regimen in this case is platinum doublet, right? Now the well-differentiated grade three and the intermediate grade twos or low KI-16 grade threes, those are the areas where we are still struggling and, and we're, it's evolving field and we're trying to see how can we improve treatments for those patients. All right, guys, you're all with me, feeling like drowning, okay? Now from here on, I think everything is more clinical and treatments and, oh, well, sorry about that. A little bit more pathophysiology first, okay? So what do we already know about neuronicin tumors? We all know that these cancers are a little bit unique from other cancers because they have somatostatin receptors. I'm talking more, especially more for well-differentiated low-grade neuronicin tumors, right? And we have leveraged this property of neuronicin tumors having somatostatin receptors to the max from diagnostics to the treatment and most recently theranostics. And we'll talk about that in a second. But besides the, the fact that neuronicin tumor cells express somatostatin receptors in you know, different families and different types, uh, we also know one of the major pathways uh, involved and responsible for growth of these neuronicin cancers is called mTOR pathway. And we have also leveraged that uh, and we have targeted that and we have FD approved treatment now, which is Afinitor or uh, Everolimus. Uh, for the management of uh, neuronicin tumor, right? So this is what's known, uh, well known for past 10, 15, 20 years. But moving forward, I think the, the, where are the advances I was talking about? I think in last five years, we have uh, really learned about the molecular uh, genetics um, and molecular fingerprinting of these cancers. And we finally caught up or we are trying to catch up with other major cancers in understanding driver mutations or how do they uh, look um, you know, um, uh, molecularly, right? And again, uh, this is uh, from 2015. I was still a fellow at that point of time and uh, molecular sequencing was very new and upcoming in neuroendocrine world at that point of time. And, and, and Dr. Tang, uh, she kind of made this observation uh, because 
as you all know, Memorial used to be, uh, and it still is the leader in sequencing most of these cancers, but they, they, they were really sequencing all the solid cancers for a long time, much before most of the cancer centers did. And they had this program called MSKCC Impact, where every single cancer patient uh, had access to sequencing. So they had this wealth of data where, where they, they, uh, they studied different cancer types. And, and in this particular cancer, what they realized that, that there are two different signature patterns in high grade versus low grade neuronic tumors. Uh, grade one, grade two neuronic tumors tend to have DAX, ATRX mutations and as compared to PD or high grade neuronic cancer, which tend to have more P53 mutation, loss of RB and SMAD. Uh, later, Dr. Reedy, who's also a medical oncologist and a neuronic tumor expert from Memorial, she presented her findings at NANETS. And, and these are NGS uh, reports or data from neuronic cancers, all from low grade to high grade. And as you can see, this patient population is grade three, poorly differentiated neuronic cancer, and they tend to have either loss of RB1 or TP53 mutation, but you don't tend to see the common neuronic tumor mutations like MEN or DAX, ATRX. But if you move to well-differentiated neuron high grade, you see a clear difference that you, you don't see those TP50 RB1, which is actually a very classic signature for small cell lung cancer. If you know, in 99% of all small cell lung cancer would have uh, TP53 RB1 co-mutation, right? So, um, so now we are understanding, we can actually leverage uh, this molecular information to help us with um, further characterization of these cancers, especially in these high grade or grade three well differentiated, where sometimes it could be a little confusing. We are also understanding that these mutations can potentially be more prognostic and predictive. These are very early data and, and uh, you know, of course, uh, the numbers are very small, but hypothesis generating this Dr. Nitteraj from Memorial uh, published in JCO. And as you can see, certain mutation uh, seems to confer a uh, better outcome. So uh, DAX ATRX mutation, uh, mutated net neuronic tumor patients tend to do better as compared to wild type. And, and uh, also MEN uh, mutated tend to do better. You, you know, it's just counterintuitive, but that's what they noticed. Uh, so if you tend to have MEN mutation, these patients had better prognosis than the wild type. Uh, as compared to, uh, you know, BRAF, so if you are BRAF mutated, you tend to do well. This is a well-known phenomenon, various cancers, you know. Um, in fact, when I was fellow with Dr. Matthew, I think we had a, a patient with colon cancer, BRAF mutation. I was asking him, hey, you know, this, this is so bad. Uh, so BRAF mutation seems to confer bad prognosis in different cancer types. So same, same trend we are seeing in neuronic tumors as well. And uh, so what I want to tell you that I think uh, we are learning a whole lot every single day about uh, molecular information and how this might impact uh, how we look into these patients uh, and overall outcome. And where this might actually end up down the road uh, and not too far in distant future is that the molecular uh, sequencing or signatures might actually be incorporated in the next iteration of WHO classification. I would not be surprised if, if uh, this becomes a part of standard classification, okay? So, so stay tuned. I think this is happening uh, sometime, I'm hoping next five to 10 years, okay? All right, so um, I like to kind of throw in here and there what I'm doing here and taking this piece of information and trying, you know, uh, my bit to advance the science here. So uh, about a year, year and a half back, I got a small grant called KL2 grant to study these high-grade neuronic cancers. And, and I was building on a hypothesis that um, not all high-grade neuronic cancers, as we know, uh, are homogeneous. So you can actually subdivide them into two subcohorts, is TP53RB1 co-mutated subcohort versus non-co-mutated subcohort. 
at least in the United States, most doctors with high grade neuroendocrine cancer treat them like small cell lung cancer. So my hypothesis is do all need to be treated like small cell or should we use adrenal regimens for the patients who don't have this small cell, classic small cell signature like TP53, RB1. So I'm happy to tell you those protocols finally went through. I think it should be up on clinicaltrial.gov in a day or two and we hopefully uh, start enrolling on this trial. This is a pilot study in about two or three months, okay? Um, all right, so we, we now know about uh, neuronegin tumors, what they are, how they look under the microscope, how the burden of disease is increasing in society. And we also know a little bit more, uh, you know, molecular biology of neuronegin tumors. Let's talk a little bit about, have we advanced um, uh, our diagnostic capabilities of neuronegin tumors? And, and the answer is yes to that as well, okay? So, Neuroendocrine cancers in past used to be misdiagnosed and delayed diagnosed. Uh, it's very common uh, for patients to get, uh, you know, labeled as completely, uh, you know, uh, a benign disorder based on the symptoms because neuroendocrine cancer symptoms can overlap with a lot of other common medical problems. As you can see this uh, graph or this chart, uh, figure shows uh, the common symptoms being flushing, diarrhea, fatigue, weight loss, uh, asthma-like symptoms, um, and and these are non-specific. These these can be seen a lot of other common problems, and 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 one of the common uh, issues that all most neuroendocrine tumor patients can attest to that is delay in the diagnosis. They keep running between. Um, in gastroenterologists to endocrinologists, et cetera. Um, I got this weird graphics um, on my screen. I don't know. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so here is an example. This is a, a, a series which I uh, compiled when I was a resident in LSU doing medicine, you know, at that time I wasn't, you know, he mock fellow. So I got interested in neuroendocrine tumors back uh, when I was doing MD in medicine, right? Uh, and we looked into a very rare subset of neuroendocrine cancer called DIPNISH, which is diffuse idiopathic permanent neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia, okay? And one thing which was very common in most of these patients was a significant delay in, in diagnosis. These patients were treated for asthma or COPD for the longest time period you can imagine. Of course, their symptoms did not resolve with your standard asthma treatment or COPD treatments. And, and so there was a significant delay in treatment. So it's really important to pick these patients early, take their symptoms seriously. And, uh, and you know, my first slide had a zebra there. And, you know, the zebra is our mascot for neuroendocrine cancers. So in medicine, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras, it's quite the opposite for rare cancers. For us, we have to think zebras, otherwise we miss these zebras. All right, so moving forward, one of the reasons why people used to get missed or, or these diagnoses were uh, not accurate because back in the days before the WHO got their act together and, and streamlined this whole classification, um, you know, there was such a big discordance even between the pathologist how to diagnose. And, and it's well published that even pathologists dis disagreed with the diagnosis. Uh, fortunately, I think it has changed now and, and the diagnosis is pretty straightforward with the WHO classification and the very standardized nomenclature, I think uh, that problem is probably more in past and historical. Have we made any improvement in diagnostics in terms of lab tests and biomarkers and, and tumor, tumor markers? Well, neuroendocrine tumors unfortunately suffers from um, not having a very sensitive and specific uh, biomarker. Um, some of the patients, some of the neuroendocrine tumor patients tend to be functional. That means they can produce a hormone, right? These are minority, 20 to 30% of all neuroendocrine cancer patients can be functional. And, and the kind of hormones they produce, it can vary, but the commonest one is serotonin. So you've heard about carcinoid syndrome and excessive production of serotonin causes flushing, diarrhea, and wheezing but this is just one of the many hormones neuroendocrine cancers can produce. 
The other common ones would be gastrin, so gastrinoma, VIP, vasoactive intestinal peptide, uh, pancreastatin, insulin, glucagon, stomatostatin. So there are n number of hormones. Some of the hormones we don't even know yet. Okay, so so if they have, uh, if they are producing these hormones, then certainly we can check those hormones and monitor the disease that way in a very crude way. The other biomarkers are chromogranin A. You've all heard of it. It is a very valuable tool in IHC in establishing a histopathological diagnosis, but it is a very uh, um, not not sensitive or specific biomarker. And you can see chromogranin to be elevated even if somebody is taking H2 blockers or PPR, DESID or other things, okay? So there's clearly a need for us to develop better biomarkers, for, but for what's it worth, uh, chromogranin A is the biomarker of choice um, for low-grade neuronicin tumors, a grade one, grade two, and for high grade, sometimes we do do NSC, which is neuron specific enolase. But to be honest, most of these biomarkers not really helpful besides serotonin and urinary 5 hi which can help uh, monitor their serotonin levels because you want to control that with your treatments, right? However, uh, lately there's been this uh, brand new uh, blood based uh, molecular biomarker, seems to uh, have a great science behind it, very high impact publications, including Lancet, uh, Oncology, and, and, and a host of publications. So um, to be honest, I have not had a lot of experience with this biomarker myself, but I've read a bit about it and it's been uh, in the field for now, I think five to six years now and slowly getting more traction. Uh, and this is just one of the papers I picked up to, to, to tell you all about what it is. It's a, it's a multi-gene assay. I think they're using 51 genes and um, it has a couple of different uses. Uh, one is very um, sensitive and specific for diagnosis of neuronicin tumor, as you can see in this particular figure, it's a real world, uh, you know, I think registry-based study of 100 neuronic tumor patients um, published in oncologist. And um, these patients who had a diagnosis of neuronic tumor, chromogranin was elevated only in 25%, while net test was elevated in almost all of them. Um, so, so very high diagnostic accuracy. But moreover, this, this, uh, Test is also being looked in from prognostic and predictive uh, standpoint as well. In this particular, uh, you know, pie charts, what we are trying to see is if the net test report, uh, you know, net test is reported as either low score, intermediate score, and high score. And I think median time of follow-up was at least six months in this large 100-patient cohort. Um, so the patients with had progressive disease, they were also the ones which had high net test score. And the patients who had stable disease, they were also the ones which had low net, te net test score. How does this help us in clinical practice? As you all know, there are a cohort of patients uh, where we employ this uh, technique called wait and watch, right? Because some of these patients are really indolent and they're, they're not progressing and you don't want to start treatment too early, you know, if uh, they're not progressing. So maybe net tests can uh, help us in following these patients and see how often do we need to scan them uh, and then uh, do the risk management triage, how, how to kind of have a surveillance strategy for these patients. I'm not sure. This is a, a hot topic in our field, and, and, uh, but the science is really good. And I, I would uh, encourage all of you all to read about these. Uh, and this might become more and more mainstream in the near future. And just to kind of end up the biomarker section is something, uh, a cute little project we did last year. So I was at AACR um, in uh, Atlanta last year and bumped into uh, the investigator from Switzerland and they were researching progastrin. And intuitively I thought progastrin 
It has to do with something with neuroendocrine, right? Gastrin. And they had no clue about uh, researching this in neuroendocrine tumor. They had uh, really strong data where they had validated this biomarker in colon cancer and other GI solid tumors. So I was uh, very excited and eager to, to explore this in neuroendocrine cancer populations. We did a small pilot study and happy to share. We, uh, we presented this data at uh, GI ASCO earlier this year. This is pre-COVID, you know, things were back normal. Who would have thought this is a different world in January? Um, and then we did find statistically significant uh, difference as compared to, uh, you know, normal healthy cohorts. And, and these are not error bars, so just, uh, you know, uh, warning. These are box width square plots, so this is just the range, but the medians had static significant difference. So building on this pilot, we are now shipping uh, 100 more samples next month to, to Switzerland to, to confirm these findings. But it's really exciting that uh, as simple as this AT amino acid molecule progastrin, which is a precursor of gastrin, um, can be a very sensitive biomarker for monitoring. Alrighty, moving on to uh, the, the most critical of the diagnostic updates and where we really have made a difference is the imaging, right? On your left-hand side, you see an old scan, which used to be pretty helpful for good 20, 30 years, I think, and it's called Octrio scan. But uh, now we have a, a much better, more sensitive scan called gallium dotatate scan, right? So if, if you have a neuroendocrine tumor, well-differentiated, low-grade neuroendocrine tumor, the hypothesis is you tend to have a lot more higher density of somatostatin receptors. Now imagine if you can uh, radio label a uh, somatostatin analog, you can actually pick all these somatostatin tumors. And this is what uh, gallium dotatate scan did, you know, so you have gallium 68, which is a radio tracer attached to dotatate somatostatin analog, and it goes wherever in the body there is somatostatin receptors, right? You can see all those small mats in the livers and the bones, okay? And, and this scan is pretty, pretty good. I mean, it doesn't get better than this, you know, sensitivity and specificity both close to 90, 91%. So very good for well differential low grade neuroendocrine tumors. And based on these stellar results, FDA approved it. I think this was back in maybe 2016. And since then, at least in Marky alone, we have done, now we have done over 700 scans for gallium scans. and. Uh, I think a couple of years back, we presented our first 200 scan data. So, uh, you know, just in brief, how we use gallium dotatate scan, every, every uh, well-differentiated low-grade neuroendocrine tumor gets a gallium scan. As you can see, this is our, our neuroendocrine tumor program here. So this is a very pivotal step. And based on this, this helps us figure out the burden of the disease. It also helps us pick up a primary site in a lot of these neuroendocrine tumor unknown primary helps our surgeon plan a better resection. They have a better idea. It helps our interventional radiologist plan the embolization better than just a pure anatomic scan. Um, so gallium scan in general does help uh, in uh, fine tuning our management for neuroendocrine tumor patients. But of course, the, the most important part of uh, gallium dotatate scan is that it confirms whether there is somatostatin receptors or not. And why is that important? Because we now have a, a brand new treatment for neuroendocrine tumors called PRRT, which uh, for which to qualify, you have to have a positive gallium dotatate scan. Uh, and this is the, the schema I was showing earlier for our Marty neuroendocrine cancer program. And see gallium dotatate scan plays a very vital role in helping us manage our low grade nets. See in the high grade neuroendocrine carcinoma group, it's FTG pad. All right, moving further. Let's quickly talk about, let me check how we're we doing with the time. I think I'm really over with the time. So I'm going to quickly zip through this part. Uh, how do we treat neuroendocrine tumors? Early stage neuroendocrine tumor, we always prefer surgery if the patient can have, a, you know, is a good optimal candidate for surgical resection. But the debate is still on for metastatic disease. Unlike a lot of other solid cancers, uh, we, uh, we do often uh, do cytoreductive surgeries in neuroendocrine cancers, even for metastatic disease, okay? 
And, and because there is no randomized control data uh, suggesting whether surgical debulking does any good or not, there is a raging debate in any neuronicotin tumor meeting between surgeons and medonks, okay? I think I'm a believer in neuronicotin tumor resection surgeries. Uh, during my residency, a lot of my mentors were neuronicotin tumor surgeons, so I have a little soft spot for resection. I think patients benefit but you have to pick your patients. You have to make sure it's a healthy patient, can tolerate surgery. But, you know, I have seen many, many patients going 15, 20 years, multiple liver lesions ablated or resected and still an ED. So there seems to be that there are patients who benefit from it, okay? And this is one of our publications. We looked at long-term database for neuronicotin tumor resections and we saw some benefit, okay? All righty, so what about radiation? That's the second pillar of our cancer management. No prospective data that I'm aware of. And so the current role of external beam radiation is very limited to palliation of symptoms if there are bone mats. But really radiation has not made inroads in neuroendocrine tumors. Maybe this is a really good research idea for a young fellow to explore and, and maybe design a prospective small pilot study to see what are the response rates in different types? I would expect uh, maybe higher grades would have some roles for sure. So this is the current therapeutic landscape of neuroendocrine cancer, how we medically manage them. As you can see, the lower grades have some as an analog. The other interferons, uh, dioxide, we, we don't use it. Dioxide is more so for insulinoma. Um, the therapy is more shifting to a targeted therapies like a Fintor, and PRRT. And for high grades, we, we do cytotoxic chemotherapy is platinum doublet. Okay. Um, I think it, because of the shortage of time, I'm going to quickly zip through. There are three studies, three pivotal studies, which were described in the last three years, uh, sorry, last three to four years, which led to FDA approvals. Most of it was a uh, radius 4 study, which led to FDA approval of Finitor. You can see the PFS curves, 11 month versus four month in favor of uh, FN4, which is Everolimus and Perenibitor. And now it's FDA approved for thoracic and extrathoracic tumors. And the, the, the recent approval for the other class of drug called Pelletrostat ethyl. And it's, I think, one of the first to approved for cancer symptom management rather than tumor management, okay? And this drug targets tryptophan hydroxylase. This is a this is a limiting, great limiting enzyme in production of serotonin. So if you block this, you decrease serotonin production and then you you help patients with Carson syndrome diarrhea. So they did this large uh, randomized controlled international clinical trial. They randomized patient between placebo and two different doses of teletrostat. And you can see here the urinary 5 HIA dipped quite a bit significantly in the treatment arm, which also correlated to decrease in the diarrhea for these carcinoid syndrome diarrhea patients. And this led to FDA to prove Delitrostat ethyl as a treatment for carcinoid syndrome diarrhea refractory to somatostatin analog. And this drug works very beautifully, uh, very safe. And then uh, if your patients are on it, um, then one of the things you do want to counsel them about constipation, severe constipation, sometimes that can happen. It's rare, but otherwise very well tolerated drug. And 250 milligram CID is the FDA approved dose. And last, uh, to conclude, I think the biggest uh, uh, winner for us and the most recent treatment to get FDA approval was Lutathera, the PRRT, based on a large phase three randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Uh, no, not placebo-controlled, it was controlled on was smartosatin high dose, smartosatin analog was Netter one And this is probably one of the best looking Kaplan-Meier curves you'd ever see in solid oncology you know, the hazard ratio 0.21. So uh, at the time of reporting this trial and when it got published in AJM, the study arm with lutetium dotatate, which is lutathera or PRRT drug, did not uh, even reach the median, whereas um, the, the control arm with high dose medicine analog, I think it was close to nine months. So, and this, 
data is being followed, I'm sure it will confirm to have overall survival benefit as well. And the median PFS is supposed to be somewhere in 35 to 40 range, I think. Um, so based on the stellar results that they approved this treatment in 2018, I think since 2019, it's been a pretty uh, accepted and widely used treatment for our progressive gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumor patients, okay? I would, uh, I think, hold my further treat, uh, presentation here. I was planning to do some uh, research, uh, uh, you know, slides as well, but I don't think that would be relevant. And plus we're running short of time. So having said that, um, there are a lot of other agents currently in development and uh, we are also developing new agents uh, and starting some new interesting new trials, which maybe in a future talk I can update you guys about. But uh, with that, I would like to thank all of you for being a very patient listener and um, giving me this opportunity, beautiful opportunity to talk to you guys and, and, and tell us what's happening uh, in neuroendocrine tumor. Thank you, thank you everybody. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Aman. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, uh, talk with very exhaustive and uh, in detail explanation of the recent happenings in this field of uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, we have uh, some questions in the chat box. Uh, maybe we will take a few of them. Um, the the first is, do you screen for a subtype of GPNAT at the time of diagnosis? For example, gastrin, glucagon, or somatostatin. Right. Um, that, that, uh, that's a very good question. Um, so in our center, uh, the history really helps us uh, tweak what sort of uh, panel should we order. If the patient does have a history which is consistent with uh, for example, carcinoid syndrome or have profound diarrhea, uh -huh. I do tend to check for uh, serotonin and EIP and gastrin, but I don't order um, all these blood-based biomarker uh, as a standard on everybody. I think that's where the, the history is very critical to help us tailor. And to be honest, uh, most of these biomarkers have limitations uh, anyway. So we try to make sure that we don't add to the financial toxicity as well. It really helps in a, in a relevant patient, but I would advise against uh, ordering all these panels on all patients without a uh, reason in the history, which would prompt you to check for those biomarkers. All right. Um, the next question is what, uh, please comment on the role of um, NPT, neurojuin chemotherapy. Um, sorry, I didn't get that. There was uh, some breakage in the network. Can you please repeat it? Yeah, uh, please uh, comment on the role of neurojuin chemotherapy in this tumor. Neurojuin chemotherapy. Um, so yeah, that's right. Uh, Correct. Um, the the places where I have used neuroadjuvant chemotherapy or adjuvant chemotherapy in neuroendocrine neoplasm is high grades. Okay. So if there we have a patient high grade neuroendocrine cancer, and we are we're not talking about neuroendocrine tumor now, high grade neuroendocrine cancer, and this is still uh, early stage and the surgeon feel that they, they can potentially resect, but they'll need some help because these cancer can be highly platinum sensitive. So we have tried it in that setting. However, most of the patient, in my experience, the high-grade neuroendocrine cancer, even if they're early stage, uh, conference poor prognosis, they don't end up getting surgeries. For your typical low-grade neuroendocrine tumors, we tend not to do neoadjuvant or adjuvant treatment. Um, you know, if they are resectable, we, we resect them. And that's primarily because most of our treatments for neuronicin cancer are cytostatic. Uh, so the, our, some of our best treatment, for example, lutathera or PRRT, the objective response rate in NETA1 trial was 18%. So even if we give the highly active treatment, 
you know, the objective responses are not that massive. So uh, this whole uh, idea of neoadjuvant treatment haven't really caught on. There are some pancreatic neuroendocrine cancers which can show some dramatic objective responses to Cape cytopine temozolomide. So in very select cases based on a tumor board discussion, if we feel that, you know, patient can potentially benefit from Cape Tem for cytoreduction and then patient undergoes the surgery can be selected. But as a general rule, neuro, uh, in neuroendocrine cancer, we don't really give new adjunct treatment because chemotherapy is not very effective in terms of shrinking the tumor. Right. The next question is from uh, Chitish. Uh, he's asking, can NET and NEC coexist? And what are your views on doing both DOTA and an FDG PET scan for initial screening? Right. Uh, we do uh, often uh, we do see the situations where you know we come across a dual histology tumor, sometimes adenocarcinoma with low grade neuroendocrine tumor, or sometimes NEC with low grade neuroendocrine tumors. Anytime you have two uh, histologies, you always uh, target your treatment and management, uh, focusing on your high grade uh, cancer because that is going to uh, dictate the overall prognosis. So if I have a large cell neuroendocrine cancer of pancreas, but I also saw some foci of grade one PNAT, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, I would al almost forget that there is a neuroendocrine tumor. I treat this patient like high grade neuroendocrine cancer of pancreas and direct my treatment based on that. So we will do FTG PET. We will start patients on platinum-based chemotherapy. We, we might do NGS sequencing, see if we can find targets and screen them for down the road clinical trials. Um, now, the question regarding, should we do both gallium dotated PET scan and FTG PET? I think this concept is gaining traction. Last year, I was at ENETS in Barcelona. There was a talk on this topic where they were trying to develop a net PET score. And I think I'm a big believer in doing both, but there is a nuance to it. So I would not recommend doing it on everybody. Again, we have to be cost conscious. We have to make sure that the things we are ordering has some value and meaning, okay? So if overall prognosis uh, is directed by the neuroendocrine cancer, then what's the point of doing uh, gallium dotatate scan? However, sometimes we in patients with heterogeneous morphology and tumor type disease where some uh, lesions are photopenic, that means they're not lighting up on gallium scan. In those cases, I do FTG PET to see whether they are truly necrotic lesions or they are actually more de-differentiated high-grade lesions because then I might have to switch gears and change therapies. So I am a big believer in doing both, but it cannot be a cookbook decision. It has to be taken, you know, discussed in a tumor board and in, uh, based on individual patient need. Well, yeah, right. Um, how many? How much time do you have? Uh, can we take a few more questions? Uh, it's, um, it's, yeah, Dr. Kulkarni, I would have loved to take a few more it's questions. How about, how, how about two more questions? I have to run back to my clinic after that. I think I'm already getting pages. But let, how about let's take two more questions and then we can... I think that's fine. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's fine. That's fine. So the next is the role of adjuvant chemotherapy about adjuvant treatment for surgery. Um, and if yes, then uh, what is the duration you recommend? Yes, sir. So for low-grade neuroendocrine cancers, we do not recommend. There is no good data in support of uh, adjuvant treatment, and and that's consistent with our NANETS and I think ENETS guidelines as well. So if you have a grade one, grade two uh, neuroendocrine tumors resected most likely it's cured. You just need to surveil them with some sort of imaging. And 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 what uh, determines how closely you'll surveil them would be whether the margins were positive, was there neurovascular, lymphovascular involvement in grade of tumor. But there is no current recommendation to do uh, adjuvant treatment. Now for high-grade neuroendocrine cancer, yes, if I have a large cell neuroendocrine cancer, and fortunately we found the tumor very early, and based on uh, the risk factors, we probably uh, do some adjuvant treatment with the uh, platinum-based chemotherapy. And again, those decisions will be based on whether lymph nodes are involved, how extensive with the surgery, uh, et cetera. 
right and so the, the, the last question which we will take now um somebody said in log spirality or a combination of both for the initial uh, treatment how do you choose or sequence i mean what are your what are your choices to go yes that's a very hot topic the sequencing of treatment now since we have few options uh, there's always this dilemma about now how to sequence these patients right so current standard of care frontline treatment for low grade neuronic tumor is somatostatin analog so if a patient needs treatment there would be a a, a cohort of patient who don't need treatment and you can observe and look for tumor growth rate and and save the patient from getting unnecessary treatment but we, now we're talking about progressive disease patients who are either symptomatic and need some sort of treatment to control their cancer um uh, my go to drug is somatostatin analog that's uh, you know uh, recommended nccn guideline recommended uh, various other guidelines recommended frontline treatment um after that we now have a couple of options here uh, as for second line uh, afinitor is approved for pancreatic tumor so then it can be used and we also have prrt and i think uh, it depends on uh, the the need for individual case uh, just before coming for this talk um i, I had the patient brand new diagnosis um who i started on analog and um got gallium scan and just reviewed them today and i uncovered a whole lot more disease including c3 spine multiple vertebrae and this is a patient i cannot wait for cancer to grow further because it's going to affect the quality of life so this is a type of patient i might pull the trigger on doing prt sooner than waiting on patient to progress because of just the extent of disease and and patient presentation however in general i try to reserve prt for a little later i try to exhaust smartsatin analog followed by mtor inhibitor and then going to a uh, prrt after that again this is an area of debate and there are people who like to do prrt sooner my philosophy is it's a radiation based drug with long term uh, uh, potential sequelae or side effects so far prrt has been proven very safe in short term we have had no issues no kidney issues and and there was a recent jama oncology meta analysis which showed even the myelodysplastic side effects were very lim- very few 2 to 3% were so they found um but again radiation based treatments very limited you know you can do four doses there's some upcoming data from europe that maybe you can repeat two more doses if patient had some response down the road um, Yes but I try to reserve PRRT a little bit later when there's true need PRRT works good for metastatic bone disease and a lot of bony mats so I try to use it for those kind of clinical contacts if it's a liver dominant disease I try to use more local regional therapies to control disease like embolization bland embolization tays and mtor inhibitors Well I think uh, that probably satisfies uh, everybody thank you very much dr aman it was a wonderful talk and it was a pleasure to have you with us that gets us to the end of the talk um, thank you very much for your patient uh, listening we'll meet uh, next tuesday at 8 pm with another expert in another talk till then goodbye good night and aman uh, will hope uh, we hope you um, will be with us sometime soon with a topic thank you very thank much you, and the pleasure was all mine thank you sir appreciate it